let me begin um, by something um, that happened way before our times. Uh, the year was 1936, uh, and that was for the town in which I live, uh, a very important year. That was the last time that this man called M.K. Gandhi ever visited the ashram, uh, or the town of Ahmedabad, in fact. And he did three things in, in during those uh, few days that he spent in Ahmedabad, which had all to do with knowledge, with literature, and with largely what you'd call the life of the mind. He had been invited, strangely, to preside over the Gujarati Sahitya Parishad, which is uh, the literary body which had started in 1903, 1905, um, to preside over it. Strangely, because in 1918, um, that was the only time Gandhi thought that he could win an election. Um, he stood for the election of the Gujarati Sahitya Parishad and, of course, was defeated. Uh, um, 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 he was not found literary enough by our writers, but he was later called to, to, to preside it over in 1936. So he was to preside over it. The other thing that happened was the first major public library of Ahmedabad, which still exists, um, was inaugurated but at his hand um, not because he was because he was the primary donor. The 10,000 books which made that library had all gone from Gandhi's personal library to the public library. Uh, so the, um, uh, right now about 3,900 odd books survive. The rest, of course, have found their way to auction houses. Um, and the third thing that he did was to, to, to give the last convocation address at the Gujarat Vidyapit. He was its lifelong chancellor, but after 1936, he chose not to come to Ahmedabad, not chose to, to preside over or give award the degrees. Something very strange happened during the course of these three days that he spent in Ahmedabad, uh, largely on the banks of Sabarmati River, not at the ashram, uh, with the community of writers uh, from what was then the, largely the Bombay province, but since it was Gandhi, people had come from other parts. One of, one of the persons who had actually started the textile industry in Ahmedabad referred to Gujarat Vidyapit in the past tense, in Gandhi's presence. And you can imagine, and it was not um, um, it was not an error. More than once, he referred to the Vidya Pete in the past tense, prompting Gandhi to come to the defense of the Vidya Pete and the fact that Vidya Pete was not yet a thing of the past. I've always wondered as to what happened as to prompt the people of Ahmedabad, and one of the most prominent citizens of Ahmedabad, to refer to the Vidya Peet in the past tense. I think it has something to do with an event that did not take place in 1936, but something that took place a decade earlier. It was 1925, and Gandhi had decided to spend a year, at, like a lot of academics like me, dream of a sabbatical. Uh, sabbatical writing. He decided that he would not move out of the ashram for one year to sit and write, to sit and reflect, uh, to go as deep as one possibly could, and also teach occasionally. It turned out to be an intense period of writing, but also an intense period of reading and writing uh, and, and, and teaching. During that period, he wrote the autobiography, which is incidental to our story. But every morning at 4.20, um, he thought that was an earthly hour, but uh, at 4.20, the ashramites got, got up. Um, one reason that I'm a past director of the ashram, because 4.20 is uncivilized for me. Uh, um, 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 and they found out. Um, uh, <laughs> so uh, um, at 4.20, for 272 days, he gave lectures on the Bhagavad Gita. 
which really then became one of the most important philosophical interventions that, that Gandhi made, uh, both uh, uh, in our national life as also the life of uh, our understanding of philosophical terms. It's also the time that he translated the Gita, although it was published much later, five years later, uh, but it was that during that period that he translated. But at the same time, he wanted to teach the Bible. And I draw the larger frame of our crisis to one such event. And he thought that it was a perfectly normal thing to do. Um, he had been a lifelong student of the Bible. Um, he had actually read, like a theologian would, large amounts of literature on the life of Christ, but also on very fine points. Uh, of theological debates which took place between various interpretations of the Bible and continued to do so. So he thought that he had earned some kind of a right to teach the Bible. And the students that he chose, or the two students who invited him to speak on the Bible, were his own students at Gujarat Vidyapit. So the students were there and he was there and they both, they decided that every Saturday they would read the Bible together. Gandhi wanted to focus on, of course, the Sermon. Um, by the way, the, the finest translation of the Sermon on the Mount in Gujarati was done by an ashramite. Uh, it not, nothing that we've done before that or after that uh, comes any way close to the kind of uh, beauty with which the sermons have been translated uh, by an ashramite, actually by a monk, a Hindu monk called Swami Anand. Uh, so Gandhi thought that he had a right to go and teach the Bible. And of course, after the very first reading, the city of Ahmedabad, among the many crimes that we've committed, um, uh, and we've been um, very good at them, one was um, not allow Gandhi to speak on the Bible. The lectures were stopped. There was a huge public outcry. Uh, Gandhi was called, among various other things, a closet Christian. Uh, um, what hurt him was the closet part, not the Christian part. Uh, 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 and the lectures were stopped. Now why do I think that this is really the beginning of a very large crisis in our understanding of knowledge, understanding of what constitutes learning, and the structures through which we do it, which is educational institutions. It's a university that Gandhi founds. Unlike what you would see today, and, and last time I met Claude was at the Vidya Beat, uh, unlike what you would see it today, uh, it actually was a place of learning, which meant, and it did not teach you how to spin. That was something that you did out of self-volution. It did not teach you to go out and become social workers. Anybody who was part of Vidya Peet was assumed to be participating in a nationalist politics of a certain kind. It didn't teach you any of that. What Vidya Peet taught you was philosophy. It had the first major department of Buddhism, the first major department of Jain studies, Gandhi thought that he was going to teach the Bible. It had the first department of archaeology in, 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 in Gujarat, from which the great department in Baroda, which then led to other things, really starts at Gujarat Vidyapit. It had the first major archive of Sanskrit, Prakrit, Upper Branch text, which is uh, then moved out of Vidyapit, and today it's the, one of the world's largest repositories of uh, 11th century to 19th century text, uh, largely of the Jain kind, and that's one of the things that I look after these days. Uh, but what was called Pratya Vidya, came to be called Indology, uh, was instituted at Vidyapit. So Vidyapit is actually a university of, around large questions of life, of philosophy, uh, engages with what we would call religion, without the self-doubt 
or the doubt that the community had whether I, as not as a Christian, had the right one to read the Bible, more importantly, interpret the Bible. Do we have a right to interpret fundamental texts or texts which are foundational to a very large cosmology if we don't necessarily belong to it in the prescribed form? And Gandhi thought that he had that right. Not only he had that right, anybody at Vidyapit or anybody else had a right so long as we approach these texts with a certain sense of equability, samabhava. Not necessarily as a mamabhava, not from the ground that I occupy, but from a ground that all of us can occupy. One major crisis in our knowledge systems occurs through these things, which is that we lose the capacity, the confidence, the right, and also the discipline, the vivek, the discernment to enter traditions which are not necessarily the one that we have born into. Because the moment you constrict knowledge to a thing that is available to me only because I am born in a particular way, it robs knowledge of all its openness, but more importantly, it robs me of all possibility of empathy, of, of learning. And one of the first things that you require for learning is this quality called empathy for all forms of knowledge. Now, if Gandhi could be prevented in his own university from reading the Bible in 1925, can you imagine what we will do to us in 2018 at the same place? The mere mention of the word Bible would be um, exceptionally problematic, both in that town, in that university. All, of course, uh, since we are all very good at memorializing things, we have a room in this very grand, uh, which was actually uh, a student hostel, and I don't think Gandhi taught there, uh, but since we need to memorialize, one little room has been called the Bible room there. Uh, um, 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 uh, so there is something happening there. Something similar is happening across the country around the same time in a place that we remember as Shantiniketan. Now, Shantiniketan is, we think, as a complete opposite of what was happening at Vidyapit. Vidyapit was supposedly preparing us to fight for national freedom. I mean, it was actually preparing what we today call activists of some form or the other, political, social, cultural activist of some kind. It was an action-oriented place. That's what we, were, we today like to believe. On the other side is Gurudev's Shantiniketan, um, pristine, probably untouched by politics, we thought. Uh, the only politics which came, uh, um, came through the Santhals, sometimes walking through that land and uh, Ram Kinkar Bej, capturing it in those great sculptures of his. But right next to Shantiniketan was another institution that Tagore had founded, which was probably to him far more important than what he had founded at Shantiniketan or what came to be called Vishwa Bharati. In fact, he sent his son, Ratindranath, to equip himself so that he could take over not Shantiniketan, but the other thing that had come about called Sriniketan. What is Sriniketan? Sriniketan is actually a mirror of Gandhi's ashram. It does exactly what Gandhi wanted the ashram to be, which is that it will engage with the local people through their forms of knowledge, their modes of livelihood, which would include agriculture, which would include craft, which would include material culture, which, is, which had no place or had lost its place in the the imagination of Shantiniketan, even while the poet is very much there. Sh 
Shriniketan is actually one of India's first agriculture science institutions. It did what Gandhi later called constructive programs. In fact, um, in one of his first case, case of poaching or head hunting, um, Gandhi picked up Shriniketan's acharya, uh, Aryanayakam, and brought him to Vardha. So good was Sriniketan that Gandhi thought that it was Sriniketan which could actually provide training to the ashram community at Vardha. Sriniketan is out of our imagination completely. It probably survives in the imagination of some people in Bengal. Um, Shantiniketan today has no memory of what that experiment was. So here is an institution on one hand that you think is doing constructive work, is actually doing philosophy. Another institution that you think is thinking freedom through aesthetics is actually doing agriculture. Now, between them, you had this gamut of all that we called life and knowledge. It sought to incorporate arts, aesthetics, literature in the wider sense, all the arts, music. You know, um, many of you do not recognize because what unites all of Gandhi's institutions across the country right now is our commitment to being Besur. Um, we are fundamentally, or oh, sometimes I used to call them Asur, uh, uh, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not all that bad. Uh, we would stay with Besur. We are uniformly tuneless, actually forgetting that ashrams always had some of the most gifted musicians in residence. The person who actually led the Dandi March was not Gandhi, but it was Pandit Narayan Mureshwar Khare. With his Tanpura, walking the entire distance and singing what they sang. So there's music, there's arts, there's play, there's philosophy, there's agriculture, and then there is politics, freedom in the largest sense. All these things combined together created a form of knowledge where no expression was excluded, no language was considered to be not fit enough to be part of this world of knowledge. You could, in Vidyapit, even today, with all its depletion, they managed to teach 13 languages. And that is one of the most successful evening courses going. That point, you had teachers who could teach you through varieties of Indian languages. Of course, Bangla very much there, Marathi, Gujarati, English, Hindi, Urdu, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam. All these languages were spoken both at the ashram and at the Vidya Peet. So you created a community, and I think same was true very largely, but uh, not not in the same measure at Shantiniketan, but Shantiniketan had something which the Vidyapit did not, because Shantiniketan had an imagination which went outside the boundaries of India. It incorporated China, for example. Uh, it sought to incorporate Vietnam, um, um, uh, or, or, the, the Pacific, or the islands in the Asia-Pacific region. So what you had was a possibility of an imagination, I'm saying, that we had before India became independent to think of knowledge and therefore structures of imparting them, which is what we call education, through very different ways. There is also a formal attempt made sometime in late 1930s, some 1940s, dates could vary, of creating possibly a draft policy of education for new India in which both these institutions and various others, um, notably the Jamia Milia Islamia at that point, uh, play a part. And this is to create 
what we called, which is, you know, for, for various reasons came to be called naive Talim. Uh, there is nothing naive about it. There is nothing new about it. Uh, it, it is Talim education, but where the possibility that you think with your hands is not precluded, is actually predicated upon the possibility that we can think also through our hands. So all that we do with our hands, and a lot of people think with their hands, that was something that I learned uh, during my eight years of teaching at the National Institute of Design, which is that all my colleagues actually thought with their hands. Um, and I was the post postman, anytime they had to write something, I helped them write it. Uh, uh, um, right? uh, but the fact that you thought through your hand, so the possibility not only creating with your hand, which is what we all admit, but the fact that you could think with your hand is integral, was integral to this imagination called the Nai Talim, or what came to be called basic education. It did not preclude what we call higher education. Because one very major misunderstanding that we have, and we in the sense that people who practiced uh, Nai Talim in some form or the other, or were taught through Nai Talim, that it was basic in the sense it was elementary. Um, forgetting that basic could also mean something which is, lies at the base of things, or upon which other things are created, edifices, emerge and take very different shape. Or it is like a seed which then disappears, but then you have something which reminds you of that seed, but the seed is not seen. So the idea of basic as not necessarily elementary, but fundamental is something that we forgot. Instead, we created a more A good word, or probably a bad word, secular education. Um, secular in the sense, not in the sense of having equal empathy for all forms of knowledge, but an equal disregard for all forms of knowledge. Um, and that's why I was not very certain whether it was good or bad. Two, it was completely devoid of two things. It was devoid of any reference to thinking with your hands. Second thing it precluded and completely avoided, of which the most horrible outcomes is the India of today, is that we did away with what had been started at Shantiniketan and at Vidyapit was that we would, a university must necessarily have a department of culture comparative religions. That I, who's not born a Muslim, has an access to the holy book, not only as a believer, but also as not a believer. And that, I think, is important, that we are able to approach text both from within the system as believers, but also as people who deny the existence of Godhead. Even those have a right, and the modern university must necessarily give us that. Every major university that we created post-independence, every major institution that we created, with the exception of one, and I will come to that, did not have any place of learning or, do, or learning by doing or thinking with your hands, one, which included, unfortunately, institutions of engineering. It, it, it is a fact. Uh, second, it also, the non-technical universities did not have a space for, for want of a better word, a department of comparative religion where I could go and learn a text. I was told that that was a domain, either I did it on my own or I went to a traditional system that I went and acquired maybe some reading in the Upanishad, some reading in the Bible, some reading in the 
uh, in the laws of, of Islam, but not within the modern university. We thought that our modernity would be corrupted by its touch with the non-modern, largely the religious, not realizing that it is that religion will come back to us in the most virulent form in which we find it today and corrupt everything, including itself. Not opening itself, not, not allowing religious or fundamental questions about life to be part of the university curricula and university design was one of the greatest errors that education policy in India made. The second, as I said, this the complete divorce between what we ca call the life of the mind and thinking with your hand. We were saved somewhat, somewhat, not entirely, by two people, well, three. One was a designer called Charles Eames, um, one of the great moderns um, uh, who designed perhaps, among the other things, the most comfortable chairs. Uh, um, including this one is actually a copy of a stackable chair that he designed in 1932. Uh, you know, so it, it, it moves. Charles Seams, Pandit Nehru, and Gautam Sarabhai come together to create the National Institute of Design, where it's it's founded on an image, but also an object. Its founding object is not industry. The object around which the entire NID was imagined, created, first education programs done till about 1982, from 1960s to 1982, it went on till about mid 1980s, was an object that we all have, which is called a lota. I don't know what, um, you know, everybody has some form of a lota. Yeah? Um, and it's made of all kinds of materials, including plastic now, um, um, yeah? but from clay to, to metal to now plastic. The idea was that here is an idea of a universal design. A desi who designer is not known. It's created by community. Every community, every usage has altered its form, altered its function. So you could, the lota could move to a ghatam, and that is, that is a very um, natural progression. Or if you think that it shrunk, look at it either way. But the idea is that, that design as an activity and as a profession needs to be away from the idea of a single source, which is the designer herself or himself. The idea that we could create and that we have created things with our hands, created objects of both use, function, and great beauty with our hands, and not necessarily have a clear, identifiable point of origin. While modern design, we would assume, is designer-centric. I, I use a building designed by Balakrishna Doshi. I don't use a building. I use a building designed by Balakrishna Doshi. I, for many years, worked in a building designed by Charles Korea. The point really is that these are very beautiful buildings. But oh, they're be beautiful buildings from the point of view of architecture. As a user, as somebody who needs to repair it, I might have a different story to tell. But the fact is that the building will always be identified with its creator, not its function. So the great Louis Kahn Plaza will be the Louis Kahn Plaza. And you can't probably have a decent cup of tea there uh, without being overawed by the fact that it, you're standing in the Louis Kahn Plaza, not just any plaza, the Louis Kahn Plaza. So the idea was that the NID, which is perhaps the most modern of design institutions, the first institution in the country to be created, not just in the country, but all of South Asia to be created, on design, 
was created on this very principle that Gandhi and Nehru, uh, Gandhi and Nehru, Nehru had imbibed it, but Gandhi and Tagore had said that design as an activity or production of things as an activity is not necessarily individual centric. That there is a community and a collectivity which plays a part therein. That all of us are capable of creativity in various forms, sometimes to a lesser or a greater degree, but people have the ability to bring together the learnings from other communities, other sources, to make a thing. Not just make a thing, but also think a thought. So you had a possibility, which we lost completely. Uh, that NID does not remember the Lota anymore uh, is another story. There's a very beautiful film by Charles Sims called Lota, which really was the presentation that he made to Pandit Nehru, uh, uh, saying this is what I want. The, the institute to be, which was actually a seven minute um, film called The Lota. The NID has forgotten The Lota. The Vidyapit has forgotten its philosophy. Shanti Niketan has forgotten its Sri Niketan. And we are where we are. Where are we? To be very briefly, is education in crisis? Certainly, not by anything that I've said so far. By its own parameters, it's in crisis. What are its, what are its parameters? That I have enough seats available for every person who wants to study engineering for some reason, but I have engineering institutions available with competent faculty and competent labs. The answer is no. In fact, strangely, in Gujarat this year, 18,000 seats have gone vacant in engineering. So by, by its own standard, there is a crisis that there are not enough takers, even when you wish to provide competent education. The ministry tells us that there is a 65% vacancy in higher education. That means with all the people who are doing their BAs and PhDs, uh, there should be a job available for everybody. But the fact is there are 65% of teachers we do not have in higher education by ministry's own admissions. And this would include part-timers like me. People who go in and out, go in and out to institutions and are considered as one tick mark done. So there are no students because seats are vacant. There are no teachers because there is not, not enough faculty. Compound to that is something that we ha only we have done and no other institution, country that I know has done, has done away with the most elementary thing for science education, which is the experiment. In Gujarat, which I know much better, most schools do not have a laboratory. Of course, you study science. Um, how do you study science? By going to a tuition class, which prepares you to join the IIT and later the IIM but the IIT or the Institutes of Medicine. Since experiment is subjective, strangely, or it's not as objective as a multiple question bank, experiment as an idea and experiment as a process is completely out of our higher education. And if you think that there is the gravest crisis today in India today is the absence of any recognition that experiment is vital to knowledge. All the experiment that we think are taking place are taking place outside of formal domains. And that's what Claude will alert us to. That there is a life which is outside the formal academia where innovation, 
knowledge experiment takes place, but the formal academia has no place for it. So you will have engineers who have not seen a lab. And a doctor who is a devout Jain has not seen a body. Um, because it, it causes violence. I mean, and we have great debate in Gujarat these days. Well, it's, we've always had it. Uh, whether um, vivisection is important to scientific knowledge, which is an old debate. But uh, how do you teach anatomy without look, touching the body? Um, or, right? um, slightly difficult thing um, to do. Um, um, can't imagine all body parts, even on a computer. Um, so you have higher education where there are no students, or there are students but do not want to do the education that we are giving it to them, which is what we think that they should have, which is to become professionals. Two, the professional education we impart has done away with the basis, which is both the ability to work with your hand, think scientifically through your hand, through observation, through making errors, and doing it. Third thing that we don't do, and this is age old, is that we, and when I say we, which I mean um, largely upper caste Hindus, have a great abhorrence of touching anything. We have a created the, the most intricate hierarchy of untouchability with people as also with material. The lowest, of course, we think is shit. No, it is the dead body. Right? So depending upon your proximity with the dead body to, to, to human or animal shit, to leather, to other materials including wood, we have an entire civilization which looks at materiality with great suspicion. We don't want to touch anything. Now, how do you actually have a form of knowledge, an attitude of mind, which, does, which looks at all material life with pure contempt? The purest, of course, is thought. That if you think you're very pure, um, and the grosser the thought becomes, and when it begins, comes to the material world, uh, your levels of impurity keep increasing till you are outside the pale of even consideration. Well, how do you, the only chance, the only chance of breaking this mold of untouchability associated with material life was that we should have taken both Sriniketan, the NID, and the ashram seriously, where life of the hand, which means that all of us were forced to touch material. I haven't taught, touched any material. I had to teach myself to work on leather or, 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 or to, to take a thread out of, of cotton. But nothing in my education and nothing in my life till actually I encountered these things had prepared me with, for the beauty of the material because it was not the material that I needed to, I needed to use it, but so long as somebody created it, and somebody paid for it, for that creation with their forms of untouchability, I was immune to it. So you had a one possibility, a revolutionary possibility, I would say, of doing away with material or untouchability associated fundamentally with material life through these three, three stories. We've botched that up completely. Not only has the caste hierarchy remained, and it's become um, more creative, uh, because you know all of us have some unease with it, but the fact that our material life remains as segregated, or even more segregated than before. You could actually be a designer today and not touch material at all you do conceptual design. And I, I find nothing wrong with it, but what I find deeply troubling is that we had a possibility of 
I think doing away with untouchability in a fundamental way, if we had taken the possibility that we could think through our hands seriously. So the greatest crisis in education and learning, I think, today is the crisis of untouchability, both in terms of its caste system, but equally and perhaps more fundamentally in terms of our inability to deal with material life. Now, any knowledge that is devoid of material life will be skewed. I'm not saying it will not be knowledge, but certainly it would be partial, could be misleading, and certainly could be dangerous. Thank you. <laughs>